I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. I think we filmed, we did an uh, episode. Ah, the, the, the crashy times. Was it? Yeah. I think it was two times ago. Two times ago was the crashy times. The, something like that. Something, yeah. we, we, it, it, it's happened enough times. What is this, episode 105? 105 somehow. Jesus. Somehow. Uh, it's just... That's just one more episode I'm going to have to convert to video now. <laughs> so how's that process been working out for you? Um, I'm up to, like, last I checked, I was up to 25 episodes transcoded. Oh, dang. So, yeah. Um, yeah, for those who don't follow us on socials, I've been relaunching the YouTube channel slowly but surely. I've uploaded, at the time of recording, 19 of the fir- the first nineteen episodes of Cryptopedia with um with a spe- like a frequency thing like a frequency bar and like it's kind of cool looking yeah but it's it's so we actually have uh the episodes on YouTube and also so we can get the auto transcription from YouTube that's the real reason I did it <laughs> <laughs> that is a f- <laughs> fair fate you're being far more productive in your downtime than well. I I should be writing a paper, but <laughs> fair. It, it's it's productive procrastination, as they call it. You know, or it's like you don't want, you you have something you need to do. Yeah, but like you don't do it because you just don't do it it's it's yeah but like everything else you're su- like you're willing to stay up till 3 a.m working on something because you're fucking john i guess that yeah see i should be identifying something for the next episode but i spent the majority of my um free time recently there was a they were interviewing a like one of my favorite sumo wrestlers and they had inadvertently shown his hentai collection. So, but they kept the interview <laughs> and blurred out the magazines. That's pretty great. But I know, like, it happened because I, I was a few people saw Air in Japan who were, were, who lived there were, were, were talking to me about it. So I'm trying to find it specifically what they were. Do, do because you because somebody have, like, has to know? Do you just have like Japanese friends now because of sumo? I. Uh, roughly half of Japanese. all of my ads that I get now are fully Japanese. <laughs> like, I don't... Well, because I'm not even watching it on, like, English... Um, sites? Sites, like... Because 12, hour, 12 hours after they air the event, the NHK yeah. Japan will re-air the sumo, but with English commentary. I don't even uh, wait for that. I watch it on, like... Damn. I, I, You're I, getting... You're going straight to the source. Yeah, yeah, I'm going straight to the source. Yeah. Not even, not even that. I, I'm watching like the Abema streams, which is um, like the the cheap stream version because it's also not available in the U.S. But I'm watching like the cheap yeah. version streaming service that airs it live and also shows like the 200 lower ranked wrestlers <laughs> to live. It is ridiculous. Um, God damn it! But yes, there are people who who I speak to that are. I'm not, I'm not, um, oh, shit. Oh, did he lose it? Uh, no, no, um, Windows wants to do an update. Oh, should we stop and then start after the update? Uh, wait, no, uh, uh, let me turn off update for a second. I can do it. I can get it. I can schedule it for like two hours. Keep vamping. Keep vamping. Keep vamping. 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 Okay. So if you watch it enough, you start to like have your favorite recurring audience members that are watching. Wait. So now (laughs) when you're watching live, like there'll be, there's a, like a a live chat because you can watch. I'm not, you can't winks, watch winks, any of it live winks on Twitch winks. Um, but so there's some recurring like people. So it's like bingo, audience bingo. There's creepy mask guy. There's ghost lady. Uh-huh. Uh, and there's a geisha. 
Um, and you got you got to try to find them. No, ghost lady is in the same spot every single time. So, Brandon, when you say ghost lady, like, can you can you articulate what ghost lady looks like? Um, let me just copy and paste it into the chat. Just if you Google ghost lady sumo, what comes up? That's an auto. That's a search that you can make. Yeah, I, oh. I just sent to you. So that's there's just the some lady shows up and sits in the exact same spot every time for hours, but sits in there's an actual like word for that posture. Sees a posture, so people Caesar. are like, oh, is she a princess or whatever? But she just wears all white and sits in that specific pose and never moves. So huh. she's just called the ghost lady. And people are like, oh, who is, like, trying to figure out who this mysterious ghost lady is. Or I'm some people lie. started calling her the princess, but she couldn't, oh, she God. looks like she could be a ghost. There's a full, su there's a sumo form that I just found. Yeah. Who is this lady? Yeah, John. You can see her in some old footage, pre-mask retirement. She is surrounded by people and looks pretty comfortable. Relax, and just part of the crowd. She appears again at 418, but without a mask, also without a mask. Apparently, the woman in the old footage without a mask is a different woman. <laughs> There's like a weird amount of like obsession that people have. So Posture the, princess. Yeah. So the thing with sumo is like people like lock on to really little specific details that you wouldn't typically see people get attached to in other combat sports. And up to and including audience members, people have like f favorite referees for very specific reasons. Like it's it's the how. Uh, the, the little the little things are what what makes it super interesting. So. I I I kind of love this story arc, like this this sub like this new arc for you, where you're just like obsessed with sumo. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why. Well, I think I can tell you how it happened. I know how oh, it happened. I know how it happened, but I don't yeah. know why it stuck. Yeah, that's fair. Because like. At a certain point, you're going to run out of random shit to watch. Yeah, but this is... There's a lot. There's a lot of... No, you'll never run out of random shit to watch. Because they constantly get, like, injuries that don't heal. So... Well, no, no, no. They have to change the I styles meant, all the time. Brandon, I meant stuff, like... Local. Oh, yeah. You're, gonna, you're just going to find weird shit from another country and then latch on to it. Another country yeah. that's broadcasting at normal time. If exactly. you're up, if you're up every night with a child, yeah, so, that's the one. It's, it's, the, the plus thing about a child is like I can watch it live. Get because it air, <laughs> the part you want to watch starts at like two a.m. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> oh jeez. <sighs> but I I gotta say, I love this like this storyline. I can't wait to see how it pans out. Yeah. I, See, I've got my little, my little, my little wall of. Sumo I saw stuff. that. Yeah. I saw your post on Instagram. They actually look really nice. They're they're cool, and they're collectible. They're the collectible. Is, now I I I, I ruined uh, my camera position. I ruined it. Yeah. So those prints. Um. So those are they're hand prints, but they're also prints. They're not the actual signed ink because those are hundreds of dollars. Yeah, I could yeah, get them. Yeah. I just don't want to. I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> to, yeah, well, to spend for fun so those are 15 well, bucks for the print of the real thing but even the print of the real thing um after the wrestler retires there's a hard lockdown uh like the oh you, really you can't you can't they they you, you cannot buy or sell them after that wrestler's retired even if it's just a print well you can't you can you not sell them like well, I mean, as a it, personal if seller I own it, or? Yeah, as a personal seller you could as an okay. official seller you can't okay okay yeah so it's kind of the opposite of how how sports jerseys work in America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, Brandon, like, this you're tired. They cut off your hair, and all that shit's gone. Amazing. It's great. Amazing. The referees used to kill themselves for making bad calls. Like we're talking, we're talking older. Oh, not yeah, not yeah, pre yeah. Yeah, old, in the olden times, they still sometimes wear the little dagger as like a some symbolic thing. That they made in their a bad robe. call. Yeah, now they they it's expected that they retire if they make a bad call. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sumo is an incredibly like 
an incredibly ceremonial sport, right? It's like, it's it's half religious ceremony, half sport. Yeah, like it's it's Shinto. That's why they do all the yeah. people. They do all the leg thing with lifting of the legs, and then they th- they're throwing of the salt. That's all like ceremonies to like cleanse the ring. Well, yeah, of it's, evil yeah, spirits. it's all like purification and stuff like that. Like yeah. that's that's actually like. So I did a little bit of I I took a class on Shinto, um, back the, in oh the college. referees are also like the ref the gyoji the the referees they're also priests. <laughs> Like it's your referee that slash priest me. slash hype man. <laughs> That's pretty good. The shit they yell the whole That's time that the, they're yelling it's to keep the energy up. And if the wrestlers like lock into, he, he's like he, he yells hockey oil like he, like get your shit come like come on it's, the match is still going on where's your spirit? <laughs> so he, he keeps it entertaining. It's dope. So as much as I love hearing about sumo wrestling, we've got a long one this week. Yeah. So um. So I won't go into how uh, they're partnered with Pokemon. We can talk about that next time. I'm gonna <laughs> assume Makahita has something to do with it. Uh, um, what's their aprons? They have like 200 new aprons or whatever that feature Pokemon. They're trying to get a younger crowd. That's fair. Well, yeah, you got to keep the sport alive. Um, but anyways, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And this is Cryptopedia. And this week, Brandon, um, I decided that I was finally going to do the thing that I've been thinking about doing for a while. So we're in 2020, which is 20, 2022. Wow. Uh, the passage of time has not been kind. No. Um, so we're in 2022, and this is our fourth calendar year of Cryptopedia, I want to point out. Is it that? Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. We, we, we started in 2018. That's ridiculous. Now I'm sad. Yes. Yes. So... um basically what uh what i want to go over um this like i want to start going over is like internet urban legends right oh cool because right. because like i've mentioned this before on the podcast i was like super enmeshed in the paranormal conspiracy board of uh game faqs back in like the early aughts and like yes. i kind of was obsessed with it because like i remember when shadow people were like became a like vogue i remember when black eyed kids were like a really big deal um, the Alcapoca ghosts thread was like legendary. There's a bunch of really cool stuff, um, from that time period. It's less good now, in my opinion, because like also it was before conspiracy was like awful. Yeah, is GameFAQs still up? Yeah, yeah. There's still the paranormal a thing. conspiracy board is still there. I haven't gone on it in a while, but it still exists. Interesting. Um, yeah. So. Basically, what I want to do is I kind of want to delve into those mimetic cryptids, so to speak. Um, okay. Because I think there's a lot of cool stuff to talk about. And um, I was there for the start of some of them. So. Nice. Yeah. So I, I really want to talk about it. But this week, um, I want to cover something that I totally didn't understand. Okay. Um, so, Brandon, have you heard the Dybbuk box? Or I have. Or Dybbuk box? Wait, are we talking about the Dybbuk box or a Dybbuk box? Both. I've tell me, of- tell me, tell me what you think a Dybbuk box is first. A Dybbuk box, I, uh, I is steeped in some kind of actual thing that uh, I don't know too much about. The Dybbuk okay. box is a box, um, I think now owned and is in the basement of. I'm I'm drawing a, a blank on their names, but the the paranormal people's houses house. They they have the air quote stebic box, and I are believe you, the air you, quote stebic box has a known origin that's not mysterious. Are you are you talking about Ed and Elizabeth Warren's paranormal yes. house, or are they? T- that's not true. The that's not, that is completely wrong. Do but they? We'll get it. Do they it. not have it? Did they claim that no, they had it at some point? They no. Ed Warren was dead before the stebic box even came to existence. So why do I think they had it? Is that just internet because things? Maybe, but they're also, like, pieces of shit, like, yeah. historical pieces of shit when it comes to the paranormal. Like, the Amityville horror is pretty much just a fabrication by Ed and Lorraine Warren, coupled with another person. It's like... But yeah. regardless, um, so, for those who don't know, and, like, clearly you've heard of it at least. Um, I have. It, the, it's a box that you yeah. don't open. Yeah, so the eponymous Dimmick Box, the original, the OG Dimmick Box, was an eBay auction uh, in which the seller claimed that they had a captured Dimmick, a spirit of Jewish folklore, right? And 
I'm going to dive into the lore of the Dybbuk pretty intensely. But Brandon, before we talk about the Dybbuk, we got to talk about Kabbalah. Okay. Um, which is a form of Jewish mysticism. So um, I found an article by Rabbi Jeffrey W. Dennis on reformjudaism.org titled, What is Kabbalah? So okay. Kabbalah, uh, it means mysticism or occult knowledge. And it's a section of Judaism dealing with uh, one's understanding and the interaction with the in essence of the Jewish God. Uh, the tradition is Gnostic in nature. Um, so so is, is that rooted in um, Torah or is it a separate piece of mysticism, spiritual stuff that just happens so to go along next to it? It's different. It came... So... Kabbalah came later in the existence of Judaism. Okay. Okay. So like, it's kind of like comparing, like it's not quite the same, but it's kind of like Catholic church versus Protestantism a little bit, but okay. it's, it's totally different too, because it's not a different sect. It's yeah. just, a, it's a, it's like mysticism, right? So maybe a better way of putting it would be Protestantism and like Southern Baptist, like, revival meetings or like faith healing something okay. along those lines right so it's it's kind of this subcategorization of things that exist in Judaism right mm -hmm. um so as i said the tradition is gnostic uh and it deals in the esoteric holding the belief that within each person is an element of divine the divine or at least the whole of creation is suffused with the divine as rabbi jeffrey Dennis says. Um, essentially, in Kabbalah, an individual, through proper study, can touch divinity, uh, which results in the blending of the Godhead with the perception of self and the world around them. Mechanically, it's kind of similar to some of the tenets of Protestantism, particular Qua particularly Quakerism, where like the idea was you didn't need to be at a church, necessarily, yeah. to, to um, commune with God, so to speak. Yeah, right? no, none um, of this seems like it's um, unique to Kabbalah. So, it's it, like there is as that essence exists in a lot of other um, areas. Yeah. So like that's the that well the general broad strokes are this is similar to this, but like once you get to the nitty gritty, it differs greatly, right? Um, and I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty because this is not a podcast about religion, but like there's a fuckload of stuff. There's like, um the red band, like the red strings of uh, something or another that like ward away the evil eye. There's mm -hmm. the tree of life. There's the Sephirot. There's like so much shit in Kabbalah that like the sun's also, I think the sun's also green in Kabbalah. If I remember that Ross and Carrie episode correctly, there's oh, a maybe. lot about Kabbalah. There's a lot about Kabbalah. So um, Kabbalah and actually all Jewish mysticism uh, encapsulates three key dimensions, as noted by Rabbi Jeffrey Dennis, the in investigative, the experiential, and the practical. So the three dim dimensions describe categorical methods for elicitating esoteric knowledge for the mystic, right? The investigation elicitation is honestly more in line with non-esoteric elicitation. So like you read texts, you interpret them, you mm -hmm. have oral transmissions of knowledge. So basically it's kind of like going to school a little bit. Yeah. But that being said, there is a subcategorization in there that is not uh, as standard or non-esoteric. Mm -hmm. There's this notion of a direct revelation which includes visitations by angels, spirit possession, or other paranormal experiences. Oh, uh, so, okay. Yeah, so in this regard, Kabbalah, Kabbalistic investigation differs significantly from secular investigation, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, there is still this component of the notion, like, the mystical can reach out to you, and you can have an yeah. experience with the mystical, right? Hot. Um, God damn it. <laughs> Although... Uh, Although um, I was a little bit confused when I was reading this because mm -hmm. the next dynamic is experiential, right? Yes. And for whatever reason, um, they categorized like a paranormal experience with investigative, which I I think experiential uh, would be a better categorization yeah. for it. 
but the I this is not my religion. I'm not a scholar of Kabbalah, so I'm going to defer to the the rabbi on this one. Um, so fair. I love this image. Yeah, we're gonna get to that. Um, so through the experiential dimension, mystics generally tend to live more ascetic lifestyles. However, so an interesting thing that I learned, um, in Judaism, there's no monastic tradition, right? Okay. So the mystics are still expected to be grounded in reality. Like they're, they're expected to raise families. They're expe- expected to participate the, with the community. It's mm-hmm. all like the norms and mores and all that stuff still apply to them. They're not like outside of the system. They're just living yeah. more aesthetically in general and more a little like more meagerly, right? Within yeah. within the sense of like they're not it's not extravagance. Mm-hmm. Um so the practical deals, like so the the last elicitation method deals in conducting the rituals and ceremony to exercise power in the world, right? So this is like the actual like the re- like the religious ceremony component, like you know, like what half of the Old Testament's written about is just like how you do religious ceremonies, yeah, and stuff like that. So um, it's along those lines. Now I should also note that Kabbalah represents a subset of Jewish mysticism, not the whole. Um, I've I've limited the focus, as I mentioned, for Kabbalah, like, very, very narrowly. But, like, it also comes from, like, Spain and France, and it's, like, from the 1400s or the 1600s or something in there. And, like, mm-hmm. um, like, like, early, like, like, Middle Ages, roughly, right? Like, late, late to mid-Middle Ages. Yeah. Um, so, but basically the key takeaway, Brandon is that Jewish mysticism has traditions in which spiritual possession, which is the investigative elicitation, uh, is expected as a part of the perception of the world. And now, you mentioned this picture, Brandon. Yes. Would you like to describe it? Um, so, (laughs) Sephiroth, I imagine, Mm -hmm. um, was unhappy with the service rendered by a very famous mm-hmm. plumber by the name of Mario mm-hmm. and yeah. has him impaled on a sword. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Just, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's doing kicky feats in the air. Uh, spoiler for that trailer. Uh, he actually doesn't have an impaled. No. He has his, he has his, uh, Armpit? his overalls. Oh, uh, he's got okay. him by the overall. He's got him by the overall, but yeah, no Sephiroth, um, was actually ex like, I'm pretty sure explicitly named after the Sephiroth of Kabbalah. Do you, are you familiar with the Sephiroth of Kabbalah? The Sephiroth of Kabbalah? Outside of that, they exist. Not really. Like it, I've heard of them. So, so the Sephiroth is not an it. It's a concept. Okay. Um, okay. So if you like, it's, it's, you've probably seen it before. Because I'm like 90% sure that the Sephiroth appeared in Full Metal Alchemist. Um, oh, you would know more than I on that. I never. It was on the. Deep. I think it was on the Door of Truth. Do you remember like the door in no. Full Metal Alchemist when they like go to the white place? No, I don't think I ever got that far. No, oh, I think I, I only I saw like one season. I mean, the first one only had a season. Yeah, that's the only oh, one no. I would have seen. It's not the. It's not the Sephiroth. Um, it's the Tree of Life, which is a separate, which is a separate <laughs> k- Kabbalistic concept that I'm not going to get into. Um, but the Sephiroth is like these interconnected circles, right? Mm-hmm. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There's eleven circles, so eleven of these in- interconnected circles, right? Um, and they like they deal with different elements of like spirituality and something along those lines. Yeah. Oh wait, I guess it's 10. I guess I miss it's double Olympics. That. Yeah. But, um, so like it's a part of it and like, it's way be way beyond the con like the conception of what we're going to be talking about here. Yeah. But like, um, just like be aware that like Kabbalah is absolutely like, yeah, has like a uh, enmeshment. Like, yeah, if you see the Sephiroth, you you know exactly what it is. You definitely see yeah. it. Yeah, because it's kind of like 
it's kind of like like one of the go to mysticism things that exist. Yeah, um, well, Thelema kind of like uh, um, so used that for a little bit for some stuff. It, well, it doesn't isn't Thelema like? Don't they like take a bunch of stuff? If my memory is correct, yeah, they're, they're, it's like a, a mishmash, grabity grab of every, every anything that Alistair Crowley could take to. Oh do. yeah, I mean it's it's Alistair Crowley. So yeah. like, I mean, it, being a power bottom is a part of the lema. So like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Take that booty in the desert. <laughs> Alistair Crowley is like so. This is a bit of a diversion because we're got we got to talk about the Dybbuk still. Um, Alistair Crowley does not look like his name would suggest. No, no, right? Like Alistair Crowley, like the name you would think he would look like Anton Lavey, but he does not. He looks like uh, you know what the worst part is. Salesman. I, th- <laughs> I think I'm thinking every time I like, um, every time I think about. LeVay, uh every time I think about uh Alistair Crowley, I'm thinking about Anton LeVay. Like <laughs> Anton yeah. LeVay's face is the face that pops into my head. Alistair yeah. Crowley is like the opposite for the man uh, who called himself the most wicked man in the world, if my memory is correct. Yeah. He is the beast, and he looks like he will sell you a mattress. He really does. Yeah. <laughs> like in no uncertain terms, I'm not like I would not be surprised if I got a mattress from him once. No, not at like, all. Like you know that you know that meme where like they have the the dude slapping the top of the something is like yeah. oh you can sit, fit so much whatever into this. Oh, he's yeah. the guy from that meme. Yeah. Oh, he a hundred percent would bring out a glass of red wine and set it on a corner and be like, try it out. Yeah, I bet yeah. you. I bet you're not gonna knock it over. He yeah. would. He would be the type of person who. Um, who is at like a fair, like a county fair? Yeah, like he'd be one of those like people who are selling things who move between county fairs and like, um. But he would like he would put so much like drama into it. <laughs> yeah, like because he had a flair for the dramatic, right? Like very much so. Yeah, theater major for sure, a hundred percent. Like. If 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 that was a thing that he could have done, he probably would have done it. Although he, I yeah. think he was a rich boy, if my memory is correct. I believe so. You can't do yeah. all the things he done did without having the money. Yeah, you kind of you kind of can't be a all around like weirdo. Do whatever the fuck you want without being a rich boy. Yeah. Well, he hung out with what's his face with the JPL. I think that guy. Well, yeah. Well, um. I think that story is more complicated than that. Oh, all of them are far more complicated. <laughs> yeah, because I don't think he h- hung out with the the JPL guy, but I think the JPL guy like talked to him, and then L. Ron Hubbard hung out with the JPL. They're all fucking connected. It's so yeah. incestuous. The whole like all of occultism <laughs> from the 20th century is like four people at the center of everything. Yeah, <laughs> at one point. They all got together in the desert with Alistair Crowley. <laughs> Pretty much, I'm I'm like ninety percent sure. So did L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah, and they so they like just took psychedelics and tried it out. <laughs> well, I know for a fact that L. Ron Hubbard and the JPL guy um, met, and like, I think L. Ron Hubbard stole the JPL guy's girlfriend. Did he? <laughs> Which, like, I gotta say this. I gotta say this. If you get your girlfriend stolen by someone like Al Al like uh, L. Ron Hubbard, like yeah. what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, that yeah. Cause like I don't understand L. Ron Hubbard's charisma at all. Like everything I hear about him makes it makes no sense that he was able to do the things Let's he see. did. Because he doesn't oh, sound that charismatic. I just looked up what he looks like. Yeah, he's yeah. not. No, see, L- Ron, he, he looks like he knows facts about different cigarette brands. A hundred percent, right? Yeah. Like I don't want to, I don't want to knock L. Ron Hubbard. Like I don't want to knock somebody for their looks, but like he made choices in his looks that are beyond the way he looks. Like yeah. he made aesthetic choices about himself that 
And, like, the fact that he was obsessed with being on boats, like, that's just, that's taking an affectation too far. Right? Yeah. Like, he looks like the, the an unaired Gilligan's Island character, and that's yes. a choice. He kind of looks like if you combine Gilligan with the, the skipper. Exactly. Ex- yeah. Right. Hundred like, percent. Like that's the way that I would. Im- I I kind of describe him. He's like the skipper and Gilligan combined. Yeah. But like shorter, like a short Gilligan somehow. Because like Gilligan's whole thing is he's lanky, but like he's got the look that Gilligan has. Yeah. Let's. See. How tall? Uh, uh, Gilligan was definitely the tallest member of the the castaways. Oh no! I was talking about Elron Hubbard. Oh, he wasn't he wasn't tall at all. It says six foot, but I'm not sure I'm buying that. Yeah, that sounds like a that sounds like a, a lie. Also, apparently I was wrong. Gilligan wasn't the tallest. Maybe I just like equated him to Shaggy. He was just lanky. Um who's let's see, so it's Oh no Professor I, and Marianne uh a movie star. Professor and Marianne. <laughs> uh ginger was the tallest one i had to think about oh what ginger ginger was the the movie star yeah yeah i watched a lot she of was Gilligan's five Island nine i watched a lot of gilligan as well yeah it was remember the days when like like much older tv was on the air all the time yeah, like, well, that was, like, isn't if you it, were home sick from school, well, it was, like, old school Batman, Gilligan's Island, old school Get Smart. Well, but the thing is, like, so here's the thing that I'm I'm confused about, right? So we were in the 90s yes. watching this, right? That's, like, 30 years difference. Because, like, yeah. I watched a lot of Brady Bunch, too, which is another 60s yep, show. Brady Bunch, Leave right? it to Beaver. Yeah, like, I watched all those shows on TV land. Like... I don't think something like that exists existed in the 2000s for 80s or 70s stuff. Like, that stuff no. kind of... Like, those generations of video just kind of, like, like media just kind of, like, faded away, except the movies. Yeah, well, those are... If you have, like, Wii TV, like, those are still, like, just... There's a whole channel that only shows the that stuff. <laughs> Although I say that as I'm surrounded by a franchise from the 80s, so, you know. Yeah. Whatever. Um... But this is far enough away from the Dybbuk box. I don't even know how we got this far. Oh, I now I remember. It's because we started from the Sephiroth. We went to the Themyla. Then we went to uh, uh, Fuck, Fuckface, Aleister Crowley. Yep. And then we ended up at Gilligan's Island. Okay. Yeah. You, it, it all makes sense now. He'll teach you religion, then give you drugs and the psychedelics in the desert and convince you he that a demon did you. Fuck. But it was really him doing you. Dude, dude, that fucking... was his whole deal. He would convince Pete, give him psychedelics, convince them they were summoning him a, a demon, and then fuck him. <laughs> yeah, no, that's <laughs> that like was his whole thing. That was, was his thing. Great. Um, I mean, it's there's questions of consent, but like, uh, oh, there you wasn't. Know. No, no, there isn't. There wasn't. <laughs> there just wasn't. <laughs> it was. It was a part of the time when when stuff was not great. Yeah. Anywho, um, so more precisely, I like to def- like put a pin in Kabbalah. Um, it it specifically refers to a set of medieval writings, as I said, from 13th century Spain and southern France. Right. Uh, the earliest book of these writings is the Sefer Ha Bahir, which uh, is around uh, 1185 A.D. And it was one of the first rabbinical works in Judaism. To interpret a verse, uh, I'm gonna. I'm bad at this. I know the names of the Bible, but I I'm bad at this one. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesi- there you go. Yeah. Um. And it, it interpreted a verse of the Bible as referring to reincarnation, right? So it turns out there is a concept of reincarnation in Judaism that I was not aware of. Mm-hmm. Um. So the supposed author of this particular book was Rabbi Akiba, and it indicated that, uh, in their interpretation, the physical body is like a shell for a soul, right? Which is kind of like the way that people who believe in souls view it now anyways, Mm -hmm. right? And in his interpretation, 
it could take on a new physical form as though one were changing clothes, right? So, like, imagine that the soul's the body and the body is the clothes. It's yeah. a complicated metaphor. It's a very complicated metaphor. He could have chosen a he could have chosen <laughs> something that doesn't involve a body in both parts of it. Yeah. But regardless. He could have said, imagine um, a Cadbury egg. <laughs> the soul is the caramel, the body is the chocolate. Yes, as you know, Cadbury eggs are very common in the uh the 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 thirteenth century and all that. Um, I'm sure they they've had. Been, thing, they've been around for a while. They had thing filled things. You could have picked any other. I don't thing think chocolate things. existed in, until the until like the Western Hemisphere. The souls, the jelly, the, the body, the donut. Became a thing. Western Hemisphere. Wow. I, yeah. I I gotta say something, right? So this has been something that's always bugged me, mm-hmm. right? Why for for us this makes no sense because we can't we grew up in America, like the notion that like China is considered the Far East, always bugged me because it's way closer if we go west. Yes, yeah. right, it's very much so. <laughs> like that's always been a thing that bugged me, and I remember when I was a kid when I heard the term Middle East, I misinterpreted it and I thought they were saying Midwest. And I'm like, oh, fuck, <laughs> shit, shit is wild in the middle of America. Because <laughs> this was around 9-11, oh, like, and, yeah. you know, and all the, like, You're like shit was happening. <laughs> Wisconsin is crazy. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of is, but for yeah. different reasons. It's like, damn, shit's it's going down actually, in Wyoming. Actually, certain places in the Midwest, not that different. No. No, no, I but, think we're but, talking we'll about on. it before we launched. If you want Bitcoin, just move to Arkansas. They'll give it to you yeah, for free. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now, this interpretation, this interpretation of like reincarnation and yeah. spirits moving between bodies, was very infrequently used by Jewish white writers, like mm-hmm. for a while. However, it's important to note because it's like the first notion that something like spirit possession is possible in Jewish mysticism. Um, and I. I want to preface this by saying that I mean human spirit and non-demonic spirits. I'm going to get to that in a second, but there is a very different, like, those are two very different things conceptually in Abrahamic religions, right? So I wrote this from the perspective of somebody who grew up in the Christian church, right? So a lot of my frames of reference are based on this. If that's not your frame of reference, it might be a little bit different, but I'm, I'm centering this analysis from the perspective of um, of Judeo-Christian based religions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, but regardless, most of the people listening to this podcast have probably heard of The Exorcist, right? Oh, yeah. Like, like I think most people in America have heard of The Exorcist. It's I think it's, it's kind of assumed knowledge. Yeah, it's kind of like a major cultural touchstone yeah like even if um, you've never seen star wars you know what star wars is the same exactly way with exorcist yeah and for those who haven't heard of the exorcist somehow it's a 1973 supernatural horror film in which a 12 year old girl i think her name was reagan is possessed and subsequently exorcised by a catholic preach priest conducting the rites of exorcism to remove the demon um as i said before however that form of uh of demonic possession totally fucking different than spiritual possession and Jewish Jewish mysticism, right? Um, demonic impression in possession, as the name implies, deals with a demon taking control of an individual through some mechanism, and it's in fact a component of Jewish mysticism, as like pre pre like common era, right? Because yeah. we know that for a fact. Well, we know that because in the Bible, there's discussion of Ju- of Jesus conducting an exorcism, right? Like the story of Legion where he cast de- a demon into like a horde of pigs. Yeah. And then they all kill themselves, which all I can think is like, poor pigs. 18 pages? I don't know what you're talking about. What? I just noticed the, the page count. I don't know what you're talking about, Brandon. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and demons, for those of you who are uh, <laughs> who are not up on your Abrahamic religions, uh, <laughs> I went hard on this one. Um, I can tell are not are not in any way related to the spirits of the dead. 
they're actually their own wholly unique entities, which I feel like is a thing that pop culture has mutated. And like, if you haven't like paid close attention to like, and like read the Bible and like gone through all the esoteria and all that stuff, you're not familiar, like familiar with the fact that like in Christianity, you don't become a demon after you die. Like, your pretty little face is going to hell is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, wrong if we're talking about it from a folkloric standpoint. There's a whole lot of other stuff I can say in regards to that. But, like, this isn't a religion podcast, and I'm not going to spread my religious beliefs on this podcast. I'm going to spread my skeptical beliefs on this podcast, particularly about the Dybbuk. So... A dibbuk, in contrast to a demon, is the spirit of a deceased human which is clung to the pos- or possessed an individual. Now, I should note that dibbuk has been translated by some to mean to cling. Um, okay. Interestingly, the dibbuk etymolo- etymolog- etymologically emerges from an abbreviation of the Hebrew phrase dibbuk ra, or evil possession, which refers to a specific type of possession performed by ruah, or spirits. Okay? Mm-hmm. So... Dibbuk itself is a descriptor for a type of possession that has since been mimetically mutated into a specific type of malicious spirit, thanks to S. Ansky's 1920 play, The Dibbuk, right? Yes. So people can people translate it as to cling to or something mm-hmm. like that, but like according to this one source, it's evil possession, right? So... I want to just preface that, like, there's different sources that have different, like, understandings of et- etymology and things along those lines. Um, so I've got a picture of a uh, of a dibbuk from that was drawn by uh, Ephraim Mosh Leonin. And like, Brandon, do you want to describe that at all? Like, sure. It's um, a guy with a walking stick carrying a scaly tan on his back, and that scaly tan is cloaked. Oh, I see. He graved it because he's at a cemetery. No, that's that's a dude being posi- like being accosted by a dibbuk. The the skeleton is supposed to be a dibbuk, but its back is to him. Yes, but like, it's, it's laziest thing, right? laziest possession ever. Yeah, it's it's a whole thing. Well, he's carrying it's kinda the like, skeleton. Well, but like you know you know in like, uh, what is it? Japan in J- Japan isn't there the ghost that like clings to your back? Like that's a thing. Oh, maybe I don't know about no ghosties. Yeah, that's, that's a thing. Um, but anywho, so the Dybbuk, Brandon. Have you ever heard of this play? By the way, I've not. I did not know it was a play. Yeah, so I've never heard of this play. Like until I started researching the Dybbuk, I'd never known that this play existed. Right, and it's not as widespread as The Exorcist, but it's which as I don't want to litigate this, but the. The Exorcist is kind of responsible for the satanic panic. Like, kind of. It's, I, it's been a minute since I looked into that. It kind of is, because it, it resulted in people being more, like, like believing that the devil is real, right? Oh, yeah. Because, like, it made people believe in possession, and because it made people believe in possession, people believed in the devil. Yeah. Okay, uh... Give me one second. There's an alarm going okay. off. Battery died on the. So it was just alarm. it was just a battery. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Like that's good. I'm glad that it wasn't anything serious. Yeah, just triple A's, double A's. Okay. One of them. Wait. Oh yeah, double A's. It's double A's. I'm pretty sure. Because yeah. I had to buy new batteries because I have a bunch of triple A's, but I didn't have any double A's. Oh, do you buy them in bulk? I did. Well, I bought the. I bought the triple A's in bulk, but I didn't buy the uh, the double A's in bulk. I gotta buy them all in bulk, man. Well, I don't have the money to spend on buying bulk batteries. It's the Sam Vines. Uh, mm. It's the it's the Sam Vines economic theory of shoes. Have I ever told you about that? No. So there's a character. So have you ever read Discworld? No. You'd love that that series, by the way. Um, there's. I tried to. I. I it never, uh, uh, it hooks never got in me. Really? Yeah. It, it seems like something that you'd enjoy, but all right, whatever. Um, I'm not going to push it on you. Um, I was going to say I'd, I'd offer you a book the next time I see you, but I still have no idea when the fuck that's actually <laughs> going to be. Oh, that can be whenever, 
after Pika gets all her whatever shots she needs. Yeah, no, I yeah. I, I understand that. I don't want to I don't want to put her at risk at all. Um, because she's just a anywho, baby with the with the with the little baby stuff. Yeah, I know. I don't like like babies are babies 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 are we are like little tiny things, and I'm not good with babies. She um, big. <laughs> She, outgr- she she's outgrown her three month onesies. She she oh wow. She's just uh she's not even three months old yet. She's a big old baby. Oh man, that's yeah, good. She that's can good be to hear. Tall, fight. I mean, men. I mean, Brandon, it, it's your daughter. So given your family and the people yeah, in your family, because my sister's like, tall. Yeah, I'm tall. like. Yeah, you're everyone on my the, wife's side of the family is like the same height or taller than me. Yeah, like the odds of her being tall are not like small. She will, she's going to be a tall kid. <laughs> she is going to be tall. Um, but anywho, the the Sam Vines economic theory of uh boots is a rich person can afford oh. to pay three times the price of a boot, like a normal boot. Yeah. A poor person can only buy a boot that caught it's it's three times less, but it's made out of shittier materials. Yeah. However, over the lifespan of the nice boot, you're going to replace the shitty boot at least four times. Yeah. And basically it's a metaphor for the fact that like there's a tax, there's an inherent tax on being poor, and that tax yeah. is you have to spend more money to live. Yes. Ironically. It's yeah. It it costs more to yeah. be poor. Anywho, um. So anywho, uh, the Dybbuk by S. Ansky is kind of like the Exorcist of Jewish mysticism, so to speak. Okay. Not quite on the same scale, but like there's analogies that can be made there. Um, in the play, and I'm gonna actually go over the entire play right here because it's interesting and. It's actually a four act play, which surprised me. Um, what are they usually two, two or three? They're usually three, three acts. So you have the introduction, the main conflict, and then like resolution, right? Yeah. So you have the three acts. So I don't. This is a little different though. So in the play, the daughter of Sender, who's an individual in the community, Leah, mm-hmm. is married to is to be married to the in the Jewish town of Br- Brinitz, an admirer, Kanan is distraught when he learns that her suitor has been selected. He falls down dead holding the Book of Raziel. And now the Raziel, the Book of Raziel is a 13th century Kabbalistic grimoire detailing the laws of, the spiritual laws of birth, death, and reincarnation. It's literally called a necromantic grimoire. In like, what? if you look it up, that's like that's the cool. first thing that comes up. Um, so they kind of set the stage for what's about to happen. Yeah. The play then moves to the wedding ceremony of Leia and her betrothed. Leia invites the souls of her mother and grandparents to the celebration, which once again is kind of like hitting on the point that like spirituality and the notion of spirits are existent and like those types of things. Yeah. Um, as her betrothed, Menashe, arrives, she is possessed by a dybbuk, her voice changing to that of a man. Huh. The Tazik, a spiritual leader... Asriel demands the spirit leave the body of Leah, which it fir- firmly refuses to do. He realizes at this point that the spirit is that of Conan, the man who died in the first act, and he summons a rabbinical court to place an anathema or a curse on the spirit. Okay? That sounds cool to watch because I imagine they had a guy off stage, like she was moving her mouth and a guy off stage was talking. Yeah, um, so the. I'll get into the possession scene a little bit, but there's some imagery there that we're going to talk about in a second. It's, okay. It's an interesting play. So at this point, things get a little bit complicated because one of the rabbi, Rabbi Samson, says that the father of Canaan, um, Nisan, came to him in a dream accusing Sender, the man whose daughter was being married, of breaking a vow that he had made with Nisan that if they were to have children in the future, they would be wed. Okay? Furthermore, okay. Uh, the, fa- the, the father of Conan, Nissan, I just hit my mic real hard. Um, <laughs> I, I've done 105. We've done 105 of these, Brandon. Oh, and, and I still, still bump fuck up mics. like this. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so furthermore, Nissan, the spirit, accused the sender, accused sender of being responsible for Conan's death. The details are reviewed, revealed in court as communicated by Rabbi Samson as Neeson's mouthpiece. So, like, there's a quasi-spiritual possession happening here, too. It's yeah. not quite a possession. It's more of, like, a conversation that he's mediating through and he's, like, discussing. But, yeah. like, it's important to note that, like, these themes exist, at least in Jewish literature, right? Mm-hmm. And, like, so the fact of the matter is these things are existent. Whether or not people believe in them or not is a whole other story. Um, but then, Brandon, the story gets more salacious. Nice. Right? Bring so, it on. the spirit of Nissan, the father of the guy who died, accuses Sender of rejecting his son despite knowing who he was because his son was poor. This, okay. therefore, results in Kanan turning to the other side which is the evil and pure spiritual forces of uh, Jewish mysticism. Basically yeah. the dark side of from Star Wars lore. Yes. Um, causing him to die alone. It is determined that Sender should be absol- absolved of this. So basically what ends up happening is Sender is determined to be absolved of the at- okay. of everything, right? Yeah. Because Not the Torah says one can't promise what has not been created to someone, right? Um, but gotcha. the sender is sentenced to pray uh, for his deceased friend and Conan for the rest of their life, right? Okay. Um, now, returning to the Dybbuk, it is once again asked to leave Leah, but it refuses. This results in a spectacular exorcism, including summoning rituals, ram horns playing, nice. black candles, Mel. the whole nine just forced the, the spirit out. But Brandon, then the yeah. play closes. Do you want to know how the play closes out? Yes. Leah admits to Canon, the person, the spirit who was possessing her. So she sees the spirit as yeah. as he's leaving. That she loves him. Oh, nice. This random well well, but Brandon, Brandon, there's like nothing to indicate that these people like had, had any, any ties. relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And then she dies. Perfect. And walks away with him as a spirit. Perfect. And that's the movie. No loose sense like, there at all. Like, uh, not movie, the play. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's what happens in this this story. This is the thing. This is the thing that like got people to be aware, more aware of of the, the Dybbuk. Like it was kind of the thing. Was it pop? It had to be popular. It was like for its time, it was absolutely popular, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thirteenth century. So, okay. Yeah. Well, this this particular thing was in like uh, this particular story was like nineteen twenty. Yeah, the play released in nineteen twenty, right? Um. So yeah, it's it's kind of a wild story. Um, it's a it's not. It's not disinteresting. No. Uninteresting, right? It's got some weird shit, especially towards the end. What, um, with the ram's horns and the black candles? Yeah, and, like, the fact that, uh... 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 Like... You know... What's the word I'm looking for? Um... You had no idea about the relationship till the very end? Yeah, like, that that was weird, too. And, like, the fact that she dies and walks away and, like, it's strange. There's mm-hmm. there's some weirdness to this story. Yeah, But it, then again, Romeo and Juliet's just as fucking weird. Yeah. Like, if we're going to be completely honest. Plays do be weird. So, Brandon, now, don't look at the header of the next section. Too late. it gives it away. Brandon, I was going to ask, what do you think the Divic is about? And the answer is sex. It's all about the. the it the, is the, all the about sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So while we're missing, a, it's missing a few ethnographic details. Um, the Dybbuk is actually like the play, not a terrible summation of the typical Dybbuk possession. Like not that far off at all. Like huh. you pretty much know everything that you need to know about a Dybbuk from that, like what that thing I was just talking yeah. about. Okay. Right. So the spirit of the dead person, or with vengeful or malicious mm-hmm. intent possesses a living individual. 
Now, the key here is that the the spirit is vengeful, right? There are other types of transmigration in which a spirit can inhabit a body. There's Eber, which is a possessive, which is a positive possession in which a righteous spirit temporarily possesses a body with consent to perform a mitzvah or like a religious duty, right? Okay. Um, Rabbi Samson's interaction with Nissan more closely matches this particular type, right? A possession. Cause like, but it's not exact. Cause like the dude is, he's trying to right a wrong kind of. Yeah. And like, it's, it's more one of those types of things. It's like, um, it's kind of like that, that, uh, Tyler Labine show. Oh yeah. The ghost show that I can't remember oh, the name of. Yes. That one where he gets like super high to get possessed. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I was just watching it. It's um, pretty good. It's uh, until the third season. The third season totally fucked it. Once, once Danny DeVito's daughter leaves the show, it like lose. I lose all interest in it. Yeah. He was in Voltron. Yeah, he was. Um, he was the. Deadbeat. Yellow. That's lion, what it right. is. Deadbeat. That was it. Yeah, he was the yellow lion in Voltron. Um, oh, the new Voltron. Yeah. Yeah. So, but also in addition to that, there's also a cabalistic notion of Gilgal, which is where the soul must live through many lives before it gains enough wisdom to join God. So there's like a concept of reincarnation that also is existing mm-hmm. in Kabbalah of like you have to refine your soul, so to speak. But. That being said, the Dybbuk is the negative one. It's the negative yeah. type of spiritual possession. Now, as with most Chris- Cryptopedia stories, there is more to this than just what's on the surface. Yes. Um, Dybbuk are typically male spirits. Who okay. Typically possess female spirit, female humans. Nice. Now. If men po- were possessed, it was always a male, never a female. A, a female spirit never possessed a male. Okay. But a female Dybbuk could possess a woman. A human woman, right? Okay. So, Brandon, why? what do you think the significance of these pairings is? Um, Can you take a guess? Just like a basic guess? I would guess like non-gender typical roles. No, no, no. Uh, so Yaram Bilu puts this. It's an articulation of sexual urges. Oh, okay. Because so, and like the traditional pairings and like, it gets more, the the reason why females don't, uh, don't possess men. There's a, there's a, I'm going to get into it in a second. Okay. But like, we'll, we'll it. So spiritual transmigration and possession are, are largely linked to sexual transgressions in this particular case. (laughs) Even the positive possession, Brandon, Mm -hmm. Iber, can be translated as impregnation. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like, there's an innately sexual sexual origin. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's something related to human sexuality in the Dybbuk, like, in, in, like, spirit possession in, in Judaism, right? Yeah. Wait and a minute. Moreover, so what kind of box are we talking about? Hey. <laughs> oh. oh god damn it. There we go. That's gonna completely undo something I have I'm gonna say in a little bit. Bada bing bada boom. I guess I guess technically there were Dybbuk boxes before the Dybbuk box. It's just <laughs> Um Uh huh. Anywho. So possession in the Kabbalistic sense is a penetrative act. Right. Nice. Wherein the spirit penetrates a living human. Mm. In most cases of divic possession, Brandon. Yeah. This is literally through the woman's vagina. Yes. And there for we go. men, it's through the anus. Perfect. But wouldn't yeah. have it any other way. Moreover, Brandon. Yeah. Dybbuk target younger individuals, particularly those on their wedding night. Uh, I so see if where you we're think going. if you follow the threads, um, it kind of makes it a, it's a way for people to discuss sexual taboos, yeah, without actually discussing it, right? Because like the fact that it's always the lady, it's the lady who's usually the one who gets possessed. It's like yeah, 
it's you're talking about a culture that doesn't necessarily have the best articulation of sexual urges. No, the so dick like, is butt stuff. Kind of. I mean, for ladies, it's 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 bad stuff. Well, ladies have ladies, butts too. They have butts too, but it but it's going through the vagina. Yes, it is going through the vagina. Like you can't well, the deny that. Enters through the vagina, and then after it possesses you, that's when the butt stuff starts. Fair enough. Um, actually, so the other thing I didn't mention this in the the synopsis of the Dipic. Yes. Uh, it definitely goes in the vagina in the play. <laughs> like they they I think I think like the actress who's playing Leah like sits on like something that like with like a flowing cloak and then like the person who's playing the dipic just like kind of crawls through their legs that's pretty far out there for the 20s for the 20s that's like pretty pretty extreme that being said in the 20s there was also like there was also like that one play where the 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 person is like the lady was like stripped half naked and like on a horse and all sorts of stuff like that there's yeah. a whole thing i don't want to get it's from the, i listened to a dollop episode on it but whatever <laughs> um but but yeah so basically it's a it's a way of articulating taboos right yeah. and moreover people who are possessed by uh the dibic um would accuse other members of the community of sexual sins right so it's kind of a way as i see it out people to out people who are like doing sexually illicit things and to process sexual things happening to you cuz like you also have to consider like the fact of the matter is like male on male and female on female right so you're also dealing with homosexuality which is a taboo right and you're dealing with like people who are have never had sex and like there's a bunch of things like swirling around here that all kind of like yeah. tie together it's way beyond my pay grade to explain it all yeah the dipping box is also that chest you, everyone keeps in their closet filled with the fun toys <laughs> it's where i keep my humbler god damn it see i the thing is um the reason that female on female doesn't happen is because there were no strap-ons i'm assuming or female on male there were no strap-ons so like they couldn't get pegged yeah oh yeah i'm sure they now, can find ways to get creative but brandon i have i have something for you i was talking yes? to christina this morning okay if a if a lady has sex with a lady with a strap on, yes, and it's anal sex, is that pegging? Um, I uh, is the act of pegging gender specific? That's my question. Basically, is that a yeah. is that a gender specific thing? Because it's still a lady putting a thing in a butt. But is, so my my does initial the gut owner reaction of the butt make a difference. That's my question, right? So I looked into it. Is whose butt okay? And one person, this is just one person, mind you, says that it's uh, called strapping the ass. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and not pegging. Oh, so there's a different word. Oh, there's a Wikipedia there's a different article word. with a diagram. Is there really with a diagram? <laughs> Oh God! Yeah. So uh, I'm assuming that pegging wasn't a thing in uh, in Kabbalistic. Okay, so it does look like it's literally. It's wow, that is gender specific. That is an that is a specific image. <laughs> yeah, I was not expecting that on Wikipedia. That is. Uh, I-, I love the caption for it: a woman pegging a man doggy style with a four strap harness and a dildo. Very descriptive. <laughs> oh, it's only been around for since 2001, the neologism for it. Huh. Oh, interesting. I'm yeah. sure it happened earlier than that, but they probably didn't have a word. Huh. Yeah, okay. So it, it does look like it can also take place between two women based on this article. Okay. Huh. All right. Um, that's enough of a that's enough of a of a of a aside. I just I just thought that was weird. Um but Brandon Dibic possessions really not that different from demonic possessions in the vein of Christianity. Um although there is like a rich metaphoric and literary tradition that 
surrounds it that is contextualizes it differently. So like yeah. it looks similar, but contextually it's it's way different. Um, which then brings us finally an hour into the podcast to the main topic of this week's episode, the Dybbuk box. So Woo. Brandon, the Dybbuk box is a specific box. Yes. Okay. There is a very specific box being referred to when people say the Dybbuk box. Um, a Dybbuk box is something completely different. And we'll talk about that as well. So, it first appeared in 2003 on an eBay listing that appeared from a person who was allegedly selling a supposedly haunted wine cabinet that has since been dubbed the Dybbuk Box. Okay. What follows is an abridged version of the original post, which was not the original post. It was a copy of the original post because for whatever reason, the original eBay like auction is lost. I couldn't find it. But this is from the second auction okay. that happened after the first auction. And we'll get into the we're gonna get into the provenance of the Dybbuk box in a second, too. And yeah. that's a fucking story in itself. So this is the this is the abridged version of the Dybbuk box. And there's the picture. This is one of the pictures that was yeah. in the eBay ar- article. It's just it's a, a wine cabinet. Box that looks like it was probably built in the eighties. 70s or 80s. I have a lot of old wood boxes. <laughs> it's like a okay. 70s, 80s esque, you know, ish box. Looks like yeah, it's we're gonna kept get in, in a basement. We'll get into that in a second. So all so basically, it starts off with the person saying like that the first buyer was an antique refi- buyer refinisher. Blah 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 blah. Right. I'm gonna skip over some parts of the story. The whole story is on the Dybbuk box. Um, dot com, but like. I'm going to try and hit some of the key points and some of the key pros because the prose that's used is important because it kind of shows the hand of the person who's, who's, oh. it, it, it shows the hand a bit. Okay. All the events that I'm about to set forth in this listing are accurate and may be verified by the winning bidder with copies of hospital records and sworn affidavits that I am including as a part of the sale of the cabinet. During mm. September of 2001, I attended an estate sale in Portland, Oregon. The items liquidated at the sale were from the estate of a woman who had passed away at the age of 103. A granddaughter of the woman told me that her grandmother had been born in Poland when she grew up, married, and raised a family and lived until she was sent to a Nazi concentration camp during World War II. She was the only member of the family who survived the camp. Her parents, brothers, a sister, husband, and two sons and a daughter were all killed. She survived the gate camp by escaping with some other prisoners and somehow making her way to Spain, where she lived until the end of the world. The war. The world. (laughs) I I was told that she acquired the small wine cabinet listed here in Spain, and it was one of the only three items that she brought with her when she immigrated to the United States. The other two items were a steamer trunk and a sewing box. This seems very suspicious. the, The first sentence seems very suspicious. Like mm-hmm, very, mm-hmm. oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Like if Brandon, your opening like, line is "I can prove everything," then yeah, that's suspicious. Any, yeah, well, yeah, we don't like like. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it away. This is fucking bullshit. Like it's it. The first paragraph pretty much tells you that it's bullshit. Like yeah, if you've read anything on the internet in the past decade, you know you can smell this bullshit from a mile away, right? Like. I didn't even have to read the whole paragraph. I just needed to read the first sentence, and you knew. So, regardless, let's continue and pretend that we don't think it's bullshit. Okay. Because <laughs> there's going to be more things that are even more glaring. So, I purchased the wide cabinet along with a sewing box and some other furniture at the estate sale. After the sale, I was approached by the woman's granddaughter, who said, I see you got the Dybbuk box. She was referring to the wine cabinet. I asked her what a Dybbuk box was, and she told me that when she was growing up, her grandmother always kept the wine cabinet in her sewing room. It was always shut and set in a place that was out of reach. The grandmother always called it the Dybbuk box. When the girl asked her grandmother what was inside, her grandmother spit three times through her fingers and said, a Dybbuk in Cleesum. The grandmother went on to tell the girl that the wine cabinet was never ever to be opened. 
which my I, I have a little bit of, of editorial here. Yeah. Why keep it? Yeah, why like, why keep it or why put it on display? Like if you are yeah, gonna keep it, why like, not basement? Everyone's got a basement. Put it in the basement. Why not like like throw it into the ocean? Like get it get rid of it. Like yeah. You don't need it. Like, bury why didn't the grandmother just throw it off the off the side of the boat when she was crossing the Atlantic? Yeah, bury it in the backyard. Give it to a despised yeah. neighbor. Pretty much. Yeah. Um. So I skip over a few things, but I asked the granddaughter, "What did, what is a dibic in a in a Kislamar? But she did not know. I asked if she would be if she would like to open it with me. She did not want to open it, as her grandmother had been very emphatic and serious when she instructed her not to do so. And regardless of the reason, she wanted to honor her grandmother's request. Okay, so remember this. Rem- mm-hmm. That's important to remember because it's going to get weird in a second. Weirder. Um, so I finally, I ended up offering to let her keep what seemed to be a sentimental keepsake. At that point, she was very insistent and said, no, you bought it. Which is weird. Yeah. Right? Like, very weird. It so, looks like the only way you can get rid of it is by selling it. Yeah, that but that's kind of like a vampire. That's not a part of the money. lore. That, that's not a part of the lore. There's no lore to suggest that yeah. whatsoever. Like, like we've Brandon. I I combed Dybbuk lore, and everything that I read to you is everything that's in Dybbuk lore. There's <laughs> not. This is it. This is it. Like, not huh. even joking. That is what a Dybbuk is. That's the nature and thrust of a Dybbuk. It's not even like a specific entity or type of like thing. It's just a categorization for a type for what a spirit can do in Jewish mysticism. There's nothing more to it. It's not like it's like a category like it's y- like saying an angry dog. There sorry, I I I I blacked out after you said thrust of a Dybbuk. <laughs> 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 I mean pretty much. Yeah. Um so the the seller continues. When I tried to speak, she yelled, "We don't want it." She began to cry and asked me to leave, and quickly I walked away. I wrote the whole episode off to the stress and grief she must have been experiencing, and I took my purchase and politely left. The seller then, and I'm this is me sum- summarizing it. Uh, continues to say that he owned a furniture refinishing business, which is important to remember because that's going to be a part of some of the things we're talking about later um, at the time. Oh, Placing is the he cabinet trying in- to pawn off the reason why it doesn't look old is because it was refinished? No. Okay. So that's not what it is. Like, we're going to get into it, but he doesn't try to pretend that he... So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, so... He owned a furniture refinishing business at the time, placing the cabinet in the basement to refinish it and gift it to his mother. After leaving the box in the basement, he left his shop, uh, leaving a salesperson in charge of the store. A half hour into his errands, he received a call that someone had broken into the store, was breaking glass, swearing, and locking her in the store. The seller's phone, of course, for dramatic effect, cuts out at this time. Um, And when he arrives, he finds the doors to be locked and and then his employee crying. Investigating the single entrance of the basement, he found the lights had all burst, and it smelled of cat urine. I mean, the employee that's, left and that's never. On them. That's just a basement. Yeah. Not not really. My basement doesn't smell like cat urine. Yeah, he just. Or maybe he was keeping like one of those those like evergreen trees that kind of smell like cat piss. Oh, you know maybe. the ones I'm talking about. Because like some of them have that like distinct smell of piss. Yeah, on account of the cats. Yeah. They're just yeah, all marked by cats. cats. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but anywho, so as per the norm in a story like this, the employee leaves, never returns. Okay. And then after after relaying this this information, Brandon, I shit you not, this is word for word copied from the the posting. They said, then things got worse. <laughs> is this? This is a lot for an eBay listing. <laughs> yeah, this is an eBay listing. I'm, this is the description oh. of the eBay listing, Brandon. Yeah, I'm just trying to picture this on the eBay website. Just, I'd just be like, damn. How Brandon, it's this? huge. It is a huge listing. I and would I've expect cut this stuff on out. Craigslist. 
I have cut stuff out of this listing, Brandon. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so the, the seller continues, as I already indicated, I decided to give the cabinet to my mother as a birthday gift. About two weeks after I made the purchase, I decided to get started refinishing it. Inside the cabinet, I found the following items. One 1928 U.S. wheat penny. One 1925 U.S. wheat penny. I think that was a typo, but yeah. Whatever. No, they're both, they're both wheat pennies. Okay. Uh, one small lock of blonde hair bound with string. One small lock of black brown hair bound with string. One small granite statue engraved and gilded with the Hebrew letters. I have been told that the letters spell out the word Shalom. One dried rosebud. One golden wine cup. One very strange black cast iron candlestick holder with octopus legs. I saved all the items in a box, intending them to return them to the state, and the family has refused the items, so they will be included in the sale of the cabinet. Okay, and so okay. there's and there's, a there's the yeah, that's the cat. That's what the Dybbuk box looks like. Okay, so just think about that for a second as we're going on. That's what we're dealing. Like that's the the thing that all this shit is talking about. Yeah. Um. And after opening the cabinet, I decided not to refinish it. So there's there's the thing. He's not even using it as like a reason why it doesn't look that old. I cleaned it and rubbed some lemon oil. Rubbed in some lemon oil. So I guess he's saying that he cleaned it uh, up. So maybe. You just wipe it down, rub it. it, it, it that's what you do with like yeah. a fretboard for of a guitar. It just yeah. keep, it, it hydrates the wood a little bit. Yeah. So it was at that time I noticed there was a description in Hebrew carved into the back of the cabinet. I have no idea what it says or if it's significant. I've included the picture of the inscription below, and I had to look it up. Um, and it actually took me longer than I expected to find what the inscription was. Oh, wow. Okay. So what it is, is the Shema, which is a Jewish prayer. Um, and it says something to the effect of hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Right. So that's the okay. English translation. It doesn't necessarily one to one translate to that in Hebrew, like because there's different concepts and like different language constructs and things along those lines. But that's basically what it is. It's like one of the more important. It's like the 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 denouement to yeah. um, Yom Kippur as well, which is the Jewish high holiday. So like it's an important prayer, mm -hmm. right? And it also is like specifically dealing with the notion of monotheism and things along those lines. Um, so regardless, description aside, he gave the monitor, the mother, the monitor, <laughs> I gave my mo mother the wine cabinet. She seemed to like it. While she examined it, I went to make a phone call. I hadn't been out of sight for more than five minutes when one of my employees came running into my office saying that something was wrong with my mom. When I went back to see what the matter was, I found my mom sitting in a chair beside the cabinet. Her face had no expression, but tears were streaming down her cheeks. No matter how I tried to get her response, she would not. She could not. It turns out that my mother had suffered a stroke. She was taken away in the hob the by the hospital ambulance. Um, she ended up suffering partial paralysis and losing her ability to speak and form words. She has since regained the ability to speak. She could understand things being said to her and, went, and could respond by pointing to the letters of the alphabet to spell out words. Of what she wanted to say. When I asked her the following day how she was doing, she teared up and spelled out the words N O G I F T. No gift. I assured her that I had given her a gift for her birthday, thing that she didn't remember. But she became even more upset and spelled out the words H A T E G I F T. Hate gift. I laughed and told her not to worry. I told her I was sorry she didn't like the cabinet and that I would get her anything she wanted um, if she would promise to get well soon. So, Brandon, I want to point something out at this point in the story. Um, my family, in my family, my grandfather had a stroke, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, knowing what a stroke looks like was important to me, right? And, like, understanding a stroke because, like, there's a history of strokes in my family, right? Yeah. So, like, understanding that's important. What he described is not a stroke. No. Because a stroke involves partial face paralysis while you're having it. Yeah. And you'd, like, lose, you'd lose muscle tone and definition in, like, your muscles would completely relax on one side of your face. 
Yeah. So that's not a stroke. So the story has a problem there. Yeah. From a medical standpoint. Yeah, the story's but, got a lot of problems. Yeah, it does. It it, it does. So at this point, the speller, the seller doesn't connect the cabinet to anything and decides to give it to his sister, who promptly returns it a week later. What was he the charging? Doors... What was For what? The Dybbuk box. I'll tell you in a second. Okay. It wasn't that much, actually. Um, who promptly returned it a week later, complaining that the doors wouldn't stay closed. Next, he gave it to his brother and his his brother's wife, who kept it for only three days re- before returning it. The husband claimed it had smelled of jasmine, while the wife insisted it smelled of cat pee. Why not both? <laughs> it could be both. Why not both? It's an old Why box. Why not both? It's an old box. They smell like cat pee sometimes. Yeah. Because a cat probably pissed on it. Um, finally, he gave the box to his girlfriend to sell to a middle-aged customer, who returned it three days later with a, with a note, this has a bad darkness. And then Brandon, after that, he says the following words, and I shit you not, this is in the listing. I didn't make this up. Then, things got even worse. Listen, for how much effort he's put into typing this up, depending on the price of the box, it might be worth it just to pay him for his work. (laughs) (laughs) Writing this piece of fiction. It's pretty good. Um... I mean, again, all on, uh, all on eBay, <laughs> all on eBay. This is all, all on, on eBay, eBay in 2003. This is on eBay in 2003. This is before they like they banned selling haunted items. Yeah. But this is all on eBay in 2003. This entire thing, the past 20 minutes or so has been me reading an eBay posting. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, this is an eBay posting. It's like a fucking, sh- like, a short story. See, I, I knew there was an online sale. I did not know that this was any part. This is, like, 100% of it. Like, this is all uh. of it. Um, since the day I brought it home, I began having a strange recurring nightmare. Every time I have a, the horrible dream, it goes something like this. I find myself waking up with a friend, usually someone I know well, um, and trust at some point in the dream. I find myself looking into the eyes of the person that I'm with, and then I realize that there's something different, something evil looking back at me. At this point in my dream, the person I'm with changes into what I can only be described as the most gruesome, demonic-looking hag that I ever seen. This hag proceeds then to beat the living tar out of me. Oh, all right, all right. I awoken n- numerous times to find bruises and marks on myself where I'd been hit by the old woman during the previous night. Still, I never related the nightmare to the cabinet, nor do I think that I ever would have. Like, w- at this point, like, <sighs> there's willful ignorance, and then there's this. Right? Like, <sighs> your mom yeah. has a stroke when you give her the cabinet. Three people hand the cabinet back. Four people hand the cabinet back to you, and you're having nightmares about getting... Like, I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in this kind of shit. But, like, even me at that point, I'd be like... There's a lot of coincidences here, and it all kind of started with the cabinet. So I'm casting the role of the seller in my mind as Charlie Day, because that's the kind only of. way this happens. Yeah. And Brandon, I want to take a moment to point something out about this story. Um, the Dybbuk in this story? Because I'm assuming that the hag is supposed to be the Dybbuk, yeah. right? Like, that's my assumption, right? Um. They never have offered a physical description of the Dybbuk because it's not a physical being. It's a spiritual being. There's no yeah. physical... There's no physicality to it. But, Brandon, this is a female spirit. A Dybbuk in history literally never targeted a man. Yeah. So, like... Oh, and it targeted the mom. Yeah. It yeah. targeted a dude. Like, it targeted... The it targeted the, the man who's owning the sale. Targeting the mom wouldn't be out of line for a dibbic. Targeting the salesperson who was a woman wouldn't be out of line for a dibbic. But if the it was guy, it, yeah, the you're guy's right. the problem. Yeah, the guy's the problem at this point, right? But anywho, I digress. About a month ago, however, my family came over to my house and spent the night. The following morning, my sister complained that she had a horrible nightmare. She said that she recalled having it a couple times before and went on to describe my ni- nightmare to the exact last detail. 
My brother and his wife froze as they listened and claimed in that they had both had had, this is, this is as it was written, the exact same dreams during the night as well. As we talked, it became clear that the common denominator was that each of us had had the nightmare during the times that the cabinet was in our respective homes. I called my girlfriend and asked if she could recall any, having any nightmares recently. She described the exact same nightmare. Same hag, everything. When I asked if she remembered the date she had the nightmare, she said she did not. And then I asked if it happened to be the night before she gave me the cabinet back to sell to her for her. And she said, yeah, how did you know that? Leading the witness, your honor. This this is starting to read as a uh, a screenplay that nobody bought. So we just kind of changed some stuff. A little bit, a little bit. Now, then, since my family discussion, it seems all hell is breaking loose. For a week afterwards, I started seeing what only described as shadow things in my peripheral vision. Uh, in fact, numerous visitors to my house have claimed that they have seen these shadow things. I put the cabinet in an outside storage unit and was awakened by the, when the smoke alarm in the unit went off in the middle of the night. When I went to see that what was burning, I opened the door and didn't sm- see any smoke. However, I did get hit with the, cat, the smell of cat urine. I went back inside. Uh, the smell was there in my house. In all caps, I do not own a cat and never have. Ugh. I went back outside and grabbed the cabinet. I brought it back in- inside and tried to research it on the internet. While I was surfing the net, I fell asleep and once again had the same freaking nightmare. I woke up around 4.30 a.m. when I felt and smelled like someone breathing on my neck to find that my house now smelled like jasmine flowers and just in time to see a huge shadow thing go loping down the hallway away from it. The Dibbix is a cat calling it now. Dibbix is a cat. Kind of. It kind of sounds like a cat. It's just um, a cat. I would just... <laughs> Ghost cat. I would destroy this pretty much. It, it, it's, it's an alien big cat. Yes. Um... I would destroy this thing in a, sec- a second, except I don't have any understanding of what I may be or what I may be not dealing with. What I may or may not be dealing with. I am afraid, and I do mean afraid, that if I destroy the cabinet, whatever it is that seems to have come with the cabinet may just stay here with me. I have been told that there are people who shop on eBay. The the peop- I have been told that there are people who shop on eBay that understand these kinds of things and have been specifically look for these types of items. If you're one of these people, please, please, please buy this cabinet and do whatever, do whatever you do with a thing like this. Help me. As you can see, I've placed no reserve minimum bid. If I can make things any easier, let me know and I will do everything with my abilities. One more note. On the same day my mom had her stroke, the lease to my store was summarily terminated without cause. The measurements are 12.5 inches by 7.5 inches by 16.25 inches. All the items that I originally found inside the cabinet are included in the sale and will be delivered with a cabinet. All caps. I was wondering how he was going to end that story. (laughs) Yeah. I was curious about how he's going to try to wrap that up. There are two there are two follow-ups, but I cut them because it was just him like being like, no, I'm not religious, blah, 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 blah. Frequently asked question, frequently asked question, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um... So, in terms of prose, Brandon, you said it sounds like a screenplay. Me? Um, it, it's a long story, first of all, right? So, like, like it took, us, it took me 31 minutes to read it, and that's yeah. not with all of the prose. Yeah, that's um, the abridged version. <laughs> that's the abridged version of On the eBay. <laughs> On eBay. Oh, Lord. Um, the story, however, Brandon, doesn't end with the original seller, whose name is Kevin Manis. And I've got a picture of that guy here. It, he looks like a um, Kevin. Yeah, he does. He, it's from 2004, right? So you were asking about the price of the box. College student won the auction for $140. That's that's a little bit steep. It's a lot. That's um, a little steep. And he relisted it, claiming to also be affected by the curse. Okay, so this is the provenance of this box. That person doesn't matter. They're just a blip in the story. They're just the, they're just kind of like the conveyance me- me- mechanism to the most important person part of the Dybbuk box story. Okay. John Haxton won the auction in 2004 with a winning bid of $280. Doubled his money. All right. Good deal. Or Jason, Jason Haxton. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The kid doubled his money. Like I can't like respect the, respect the grind. Yeah. Um, Jason Haxton was a professor and museum director who took the story of the box from Internet Urban Legend 
to the broader public in a 2012 horror movie, The Possession. The movie The Possession is based on the story. The movie by Sam Raimi is based on this story. Okay. So, so I guess similar, he did end up selling his screenplay, but for $140. This is not Kevin Manis. But yes, he did basically sell a screenplay. Yeah. But he didn't make any money off of it. Um, so similarly, Haxton claimed uh, about hair loss, smelling bad owners, and general bad luck after taking ownership of the box. That's just called aging, my friend. Pretty much. Uh, the problems allegedly came to an end after following the advice of a rabbi to put the cabinet into a gold-lined wooden container. Which supposedly negated the spirits within, which I've literally never heard gold doing that. Spirits silver hate lined. Gold. If it was silver lined, I would get it, because like there's a tradition of that. Gold line makes no fucking yeah, sense. Yeah, I've me. never heard of that. <laughs> yeah. Um. When asked if he would sell the box, he uh he would respond in this is exact a direct quote. Thousands of people are begging me to take it, begging to take it off my hands at any point, but it's not ethically ethical to sell it for me. It's not for sale. Naturally, however, Haxon, as I mentioned before, had no problem selling the rights for the story in 2004 as soon as he got the box, <laughs> which led to the aforementioned 2012 Sam Raimi film. So, like, yeah. he had no problem profiting off it at all. Because, no. like, he also made a book about it. So, like, dude made back his $280, right? Um, and this is a picture of, uh, of Haxton, he and he looks... just doesn't look trustworthy. No, he looks... It's very suspicious. He's got a vibe to him. So he look. You know what he look. He looks like a guy who like this is his first time, like l not scheming or like like doing some shystery. It's his mm -hmm. first time doing some shystery, and he's like excited that he, he's getting away with it. Like that's what he looks like. He just looks like a guy who's like the first time he's ever tried to like be like, oh, yeah. I've got this magic box. You want it? And he's totally getting away with it, and he's stoked. That's how he looks. Yeah. So, um, I also want to point out, and I didn't include this in the copy, he made, like, multiple replicas of the Dybbuk box at this time. Like, multiple okay. replicas. Um, and in the book, he claimed that he put the Dybbuk box in the attic, but he later would claim that he buried the Dybbuk box in his yard, in that gold line thing. Okay, I mean, as long Which as he was open about the replicas being replicas, hey. Eh. So, um... Like, when they film the Dybbuk box for, like, things, they usually are filming the replica, it turns out. Um, somebody looked into it, and they figured that out. Okay. But Brandon, despite burying the box, he's not the last owner. Okay. That honor goes to Zach Baggins of the Ghost Adventures fame. That That's probably who... That's probably who you were thinking of. Crisscrossing yeah. my wires, yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to I didn't want to give away, the like, that part of the story. Um... He was gifted the box in 2016 for some fucking reason. Zach put the box on display in his Las Vegas Haunted Museum, which I shit you not, Brandon, is in a glass case surrounded by a thick layer, like a thick salt syrup girl. You see the picture immediately yeah. below? The Dybbuk box is in the, is in the background. That, like the white shit around it, that's salt. That... I mean, that's a solid effect. Like, if you've got a museum of spooky stuff, like, yeah. that totally is, like, the SCP, like, extra it, it's thing. It's got it. To, like, it's got the containment yeah. vibe. Like, it's got, yeah. it's got, if it was, like, a magic trick, it'd be a seller. Like, that little thing that well, gives yeah. it a little more. It, it's selling the, it's selling the story. Yeah. Right? Like, that's a part of it. Because, like, it's closed, so you can't even look at it. It's just a wooden box that has yeah. some, like, wine things on it. So, like, it's. It's kind of dumb to look at. Like, there's no nothing interesting to look at. It's like looking at Annabelle the doll. Yeah. It's not interesting. No. Like, oh, there it there's, is. There's a story behind it that's, like, more interesting. But The like, story is the, the cool thing. The thing is just a thing. You see it and you go, yeah. yep, that's it. It's actually really, like, there's other historical items that I look at and I'm like, wow, that's fucking cool. This, it's a box that looks like it was mass produced. This coffee mug is literally more interesting than that box. I agree, and it's a picture of a cat, which is why it's more interesting. Yeah, it's it's a cat dry heaving. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story there. There is. Picture's a thousand words, man. Um, 
So this Dybbuk box has now become the centerpiece of his Las Vegas muse- haunted museum. Um, and Zach claims that shortly following the Dybbuk box's arrival, mysterious protruding holes began to appear in the walls around the artifact as if something was trying to break out from within the exhibit. Oh, and geez. now, Brandon, I alluded to this on the, the Discord. Post Malone enters the story at this point. Nice. So he touches the Dybbuk box container in 2018, and there's like a minute-long video of it. And then he claims that his spade of bad luck was directly the result of touching it. Wait, Posty? What bad Post luck Malone. did he have in 2018? Uh, like, he, there was, like, a bunch of car accidents and shit. Okay, because like, I, I, he was blowing up in 2018. Yeah, like, a bunch of bad stuff happened to him, I guess. Like, But, like, rich people bad stuff? Yeah. I'm Yeah. Like, I don't mean to diminish anyone's struggles, but, like, oh, Post no, Malone you can, has... You, you can with Post Malone. So, Post Malone's fam- his family owns the Dallas Cowboys, so he was yeah. never, like... You, yeah, and like <laughs> you can diminish this stuff. Love, like he's a really fun dude. There's nothing to dislike about him. Like, uh, but still, yeah. Like also, Post Malone kind of has his own Magic the Gathering card. Like someone made a commander for him that he could run. Yeah. So, oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, I would uh, totally watch second. that. Oh, he he does. He plays on the command zone. Oh, um, I watched him actually, play. Actually, I watched him play. He fucking other games. loves. He loves Magic: The Gathering. Yeah. Um, like I would a hundred percent. Yeah, he's he's actually a really big Magic: The Gathering player, and of course he's rich, so like he can afford all the good shit. Yeah, he doesn't have to buy like re- the the replica Black Lotus. He can just get the actual Black Lotus. Yeah. Yeah, and he has a good, pretty much has, uh, not not Gucci. It's a um. He's got a cool guitar. He yeah. spends his money in ways that I, I'm like, you know what? I can't be I can't mad at that. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. So, in 2020, Brandon, um, there was a quarantine season of Ghost Adventures. I want to point out. Oh, which okay. I didn't know existed, which sounds hilarious to me. And yeah, like, it simultaneously sounds hilarious and the most boring thing ever. Yeah. Right. Like. It's a combination of the two. So they had a special, Brandon, where he opened the box. Oh, please and now, tell me what they did. Given that I've seen multiple pictures of the box being opened, and I posted those pictures in this copy, it makes the conclusion to Al Capone safe riveting, in my opinion. And, like, I didn't watch the video because I didn't feel like spending $2 and giving Ghost Event... I don't. I didn't feel like giving Zach Baggins my $2. Yeah. Um, but it looks like they also took a spectrogram, like spectrogram photography of the box, which is hilarious to me. Wait a m- like, oh, you're right. Like, you're right. Why? <laughs> is because... all I can say is why? What does that achieve? Because most people just see a thing like that, and, and go, they think it's. Oh, that's cool, and I don't want looking, and I don't understand it. Therefore, it's <laughs> it's co- valid. It's valid. Yeah, yeah. Um, which brings me to my uh, my next title. People are dumb, Brandon. People are dumb. Yeah. Um, if you like, I said before, if you've ever read a creepy pasta, it's pretty fucking obvious that the Dybbuk box is a creepy pasta. Like the story literally reads like a creepy pasta. It's got strange specifics that no one would remember, right? Literary cliche- cliches and just generally over dramatic writing. Like the fact yeah. that he says, and then things got worse, and then things got even worse is like kind of like stereotypical. Um, and don't get me wrong, I love the story because I love creepypasta, but it's very clearly a story, right? Yeah. And not only that, the eponymous Dybbuk of this Dybbuk box, no way, shape, or form related to the Jewish mysticism version. That's why I covered Kabbalah and the original Dybbuk, because it's very important to understand how much bullshit is embedded in this story. A lot. Right? Like, a lot. Like, more than usual. Um, And, like, because none of the behaviors or phenomena associated had ever been associated with a Dybbuk. Uh, a Dybbuk, with the exception of, of vaginas, has never inhabited a box. <laughs> um, But, Brandon, there's a kicker to this. Okay. 
we've known definitively that since 20, 2015, the Dybbuk box is a hoax. Definitively, Brandon. Okay. So, Kevin Manis. Okay. Huh? Oh, no, what I was going to ask. Say? Oh, I was going to say, well, how, how do we know that? And then you just immediately want to answer the question. <laughs> okay. Kevin Manis, the guy who wrote the original posting. Yeah. Posted to haunt me a Facebook group on October 24th, 2015. I am the original creator of the story of the Dybbuk box, which appeared as one of my eBay posts back in 2003. The idea that Dybbuk boxes have some kind of history prior to my story and the idea that a Dybbuk box could contain anything other than a Dybbuk, along with any deviation to the type of contents I created found inside the, to be found inside the Dybbuk box, is laughable at best. How about this? If anybody can find any reference to a Dybbuk box anywhere on in the history prior to my eBay post, I'll pay you $100,000 and tattoo your name on my forehead. I so, would consider that myth busted. <laughs> right there well the funny thing is somebody um the, the funny thing is someone's response to that was but you totally didn't make the whole story up and are mad because other people made up more stuff and i don't know what that was trying to say whatsoever because that is an incoherent sentence yeah there people are just like they're claiming he's just butthurt but brandon it gets even better and okay. if, you, if that's if that's like, oh, that's not him. That's somebody else, right? Kenny Biddell, who I think has appeared on our podcast before because he's a Skeptical Inquirer person. And I like frequently go to Skeptical Inquirer for these, like just to do, you know, verification. Yeah. Um, he did some research and found out that it's not a wine cabinet at all, Brandon. It is an incomplete mini bar with patent number 2836477 filed on September 18th, 1957 in New York by Robert B. Karoff, which means, Brandon, the box itself literally can't match the provenance of the original story. Yeah. It- <laughs> like, time-wise, it literally can't match. And we, we know the 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 date. We that know the it patent worked. number. <laughs> oh. And, Brandon, not only that, but... That's the patent date. That's not the production date. Yeah. So, like, what the fuck? Um, but, Brandon, that means that the the Dimmick box is, in fact, a spirit box for what oh, it's worth. Oh, you're right. Just not the kind of spirit box that they think it is. You're right. Um, and here's a picture of Kenny Bido with his, quote, unquote, spirit box. It's That's pretty good. That's so funny. I, uh, if I was him, it, I'd do the same thing. That's perfect. But it's like... It's literally in the Dybbuk box. It's identical. I have those like, same glasses no- in my cabinet right now. Do you really? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the actual set, that, that glass and shot glass set. I've got those. That's great. But like literally, that is exactly the same thing. There is nothing structurally different. No. It is, in fact, the Dybbuk box. Kevin Manish just found an old box, and he was like, I'm going to write a story about this. Yeah. That's it. That's it. But Brandon, if that's... St- Still not enough? I have more proof that it's fake. Oh, no. Because Charles Moss interviewed Manus directly about whether or not the box was real, to which she replied, I am a creative writer. The Dybbuk box is a story that I created, and the Dybbuk story has done exactly what I intended it to do when I posted it 20 years ago, which has become an interactive horror story in real time. I added new elements to the Dybbuk box story over the years to help it evolve, keep it Relevant and interesting. Now, Moss then, because he's a fucking amazing reporter, brings us up to Haxton and Baggins, and their response is kind of fucking hilarious. Haxton says, the one who made all the money off of the movie, Yeah. I always call it a wish box. Whoever created the Dybbuk box gave it a power to do something. The creation of the Dybbuk box is a story... And its story created a ripple effect in people's lives. Referring to Manus, he says, the sum of the Dybbuk box is greater than he ever imagined. It, Which Brandon, I don't know, like, he's not wrong. Like, technically not incorrect. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's very clear that he considers a wish box because he got paid. Like, yeah. Because there's no other reason why he would call it a wish box other than the fact he benefited from it. Because yeah. you don't call a cursed box a wish box 
offhandedly in an interview with someone if you didn't, like, fucking definitely benefit from it. Yeah. Um, however, the current owner, Zach Baggins, was far more hostile in his response, and I'm going to quote what he said here. Oh, I'm excited for this one. Since owning the Dybbuk box, there have been countless documented experiences people have had with it, Baggin writes. Not just myself, but my museum staff, my fellow crew members, visitors, and most notably, Post Malone. (laughs) I think there is so much more to the Dybbuk box, and regardless of its origins, it is very much cursed and evil, Baggins continues. I'm not surprised that more controversy and conflict keep arising from it. The Dybbuk box has always raised questions and intrigue, and this adds to its narrative. Which, translation, for those of you who didn't quite pick up on it, is, fuck you, it's my turn to make money on the grift. Yeah. That's so funny. He's so salty. Oh, he's so he, salty. As well, evidenced he knows it's, by the salt surrounding the box. He knows it's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's very clear. Like, you'd have to be a moron not to know it was bullshit. Like. Yeah. There is too much information around this box, and there's we know too much about its provenance that, like, we can't call it anything other than completely fucking fake. Yeah, like, it's in his best financial interest to squash any of, like, these facts floating up about its actual origins so he can mm-hmm. keep selling episodes to whatever yeah, Best Ventures is on. And he can um, sell, sell tickets. Yeah. Yeah. It's... it's it's fucking hilarious. And Brandon, a Dybbuk box is more or less the rep- reproductions. Like, yeah. they're not, they never ever contain a spirit. It's not real. Yeah. Because like, first of all, first of all, <laughs> capturing a spirit in a box is not real on its own. Like, I don't need no. to, I feel like I don't need to litigate that point. But like, even more so, if we operate under the assumption that it's possible, it doesn't make any sense with the lore that we know. No, not at so, all. So yeah, I I totally misunderstood the Dybbuk box completely. I did too, and it's a fucking insane story, is all I can say. Yeah, um, no, it's nuts. Yeah, but that's all I got for this week's episode, Brandon. Nice. Um, so without further ado, I guess let's uh, let's close this one. I out. just want at... to say that I I'm oh. happy we did another one where there's no guessing at the origins. It's just like oh oh no, it's this I. It's, I, I love, love episodes like this. I love episodes like this because it's like, oh no, we have like we have like the documentation that says that this is fake. We like, we know all of the things about the thing. Like we know when the guy who started it and when in in the wise and all that. And then we, we have know. the actual object itself, not just the story around it, and we know the origin of that. It's great. We have the fucking patent number, <laughs> yeah. so we know when it was produced. Yeah, yeah it's. It's it's such a fucking like it's one of those things where like so it's one of those things where like people have this ability to pretend that something that's clearly fake is not fake. Yeah. And it like goes beyond mere cognitive dissonance, right? Like cuz like there's a willfulness in continuing the the dipic box. Right, like conceptually, there is a direct willfulness that all these individuals who still believe it are doing. Um, now, I mean, there's probably some people who believe it legitimately, but everyone who's ever owned it is completely bullshit. Yeah, I mean, like I, everyone who reads, even like a copy pasta to, to some extent, there's going to be a percent there, like, oh, this is just fine. Well, yeah, it. this is real. Like there are people who believe that the Russian sleep experiment is a real, th- a real story. Yeah. So like, it's a thing, right? But yeah, no, I, um, I, I've actually been sitting, I've been working on this story for a while, believe it or not. Yeah. I like that. That, that, that's, that's yeah. uh, I, the, 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 uh, uh, applause on this one. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with, uh, the fucking bullshit turns we found this time. Um, but anyways, let's close out the episode because we're almost at two hours. Because yeah. this is a long. Episode. Oh, just real um, quick, my brain ADD. The yeah. because Ghost Adventures guy, because he know like how like yeah. ghost shows were all popular for a while, and uh-huh. then do you remember, kind of around the same time, mining shows were very popular, and it was just people mining. 
Wasn't there like a ghost mine show? Yes, that's what I was going to okay. ask. Did you ever see the, the ghost I mine show I, where they combined I didn't see both it, of them into like but, one mega yeah. bullshit? <laughs> but I did know it existed. I never saw it, but I knew it existed. Oh, I was so happy when I saw I never watched it, but I sure saw some commercials. And I was like, I, are you shitting me? So that reminds me of a personal like shame that I have right now. Yeah. I've been kind of watching episodes of Pawn Stars just for fun. That, like I've just been like new ones. I've just been putting. There's new episodes of Pawn Stars, but I've been watching like compilations. Oh, okay, are you watching like, like sk- are like Skinny Chumley or Fat Chumley? Both. But oh, all. so you're all over all, all. Oh, everything. okay. Um, I know it's like fabricated, but like. Yeah. I kind of love it, mainly because I like to look at the historical artifacts more than anything else. Yeah. Oh, another combo sh- uh, thing. So you know how like there's the, how moonshining shows were all very popular, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then how cooking competition shows are very popular. There's now a moonshine competition show. <laughs> they just keep combining, like taking existing things and trying to smash them together to make them. Oh, that reminds me. There's a new season of Love Is Blind coming this 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 February. So like that's gonna be a thing. It, oh yeah, I should watch that. I'm probably I'm definitely gonna watch it because Christine is gonna watch it, and I'll be along for the ride. Okay, yeah. And I I don't hate that because usually I'm just playing on my Switch while she's watching, and like I just like I'm like the fuck did they just say? <laughs> uh. Which is great. Because that's like the exact level of involvement I need in that kind of content. Because if I'm yeah. any more involved, I'll go insane. Yeah. <laughs> like the circle. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly yeah. like the circle. That fucking shit is hilarious. I can't wait till um, the next season comes out. I can't either. There's actually circles in other countries, but like the dubbing's weird. Oh. So. It's like, am I going to have to get a VPN just to watch Four in the Circle? You can watch some Four in the Circle on Netflix right now. No shit. Okay. Like I think there's a Spain the Spain versions on Netflix or the French version. One of the two. I'll have to check that out. Um I need something anywho. to fill my time that's not sumo or attack on Titan. That's fair. That's fair. Um so now I'm gonna finally get to our plugs. Woo! Just because we're at two hours, um, and I'm sure the people wanna move on and listen to some other podcast or There is no other podcast, John. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot. Gotta, gotta Even though we've those. referenced, I think, two other we referenced ones. referenced three this episode, <laughs> three, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Behind the Bastards, The Dollop, and Oh No, Ross and Carrie. Oh, we, yep, we referenced three, three podcasts three. this episode. Um, so our website is CryptopediaCast.com. Our Instagram is at CryptopediaCast. Twitter is at CryptopediaCast. Email is CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or us at CryptopediaCast.com. Um, I've been recently, as I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, I've been reworking the YouTube channel. Um we're re-uploading all of the episodes of the podcast. I'm currently um, transcoding a bunch of them into video files. Yeah, I don't know who this we I'm is be- that the you are, and I give you the credit for that because that is effort. That is effort, sir. Yeah. yeah um, so the real re- like I mentioned before, I think we're we're doing that to get the the subtitles right, and then we're going to use those subtitles. Um, as a basis so we can do the transcripts so we can improve the accessibility of the podcast overall like that's that's kind of the goal that um i personally had in mind doing all this uh so if anyone's got any critiques or questions feel free to send me uh, a line on our uh our instagram or twitter or discord facebook whatever any any of the any of the platforms um, we also have a Patreon, and Brandon, would you be willing to thank our patrons this week? I will be willing. Our patrons this week are Clay Sinclair, Marty Von Party, Bird Schneider, Jonathan Shepard, Matthew Smith, and Bushcraft Kelso. All right, cool. Um, if you so, Spotify has added a rate review, a uh, ra- uh, rating system now. Um, so if you listen on Spotify and you have the app, you have to do it on the phone app. I looked into it. You can rate the podcast. So if you could do that, that would be great because most of our listenership actually comes from Spotify. Um, so I'd really appreciate it. We'd really appreciate it if you rated the podcast. Um, but if you're not using Spotify, don't install Spotify and like navigate to it if you don't have to. Like 
There's no pressure. A, I want to switch to Spotify, but I don't want to have to resub to all my podcasts that I listen to. I switched to Spotify because of um, last podcast on the left. Oh, uh, see, I, it's my main. There's four podcasts, by the way. Oh uh, yeah, see, I I just listened to oh fourth. There we go. Yeah, I'll, I listen to that one indiv- on Spotify just because that's the only place to get it. But I have 158 podcasts <laughs> that I sub to, and I don't want to resub somewhere else. That's fair. That's fair. I also just got tired of downloading podcast episodes and streaming them. Just was like Spotify has a reliable stream. Oh, service. see, I download them because of where I work. If I'm in office, oh yeah, well, yeah, well, you where you work is like, <laughs> yeah. That's a whole nother story. Like you can't... I, I don't leave my house. So yeah. I haven't left my house for like an extended period in two full years now. Oh, Erica thought she she had a cough and she was like, Oh no, oh no. And I was like, You it's I'll get you a humidifier. It's you haven't left the house in two months. <laughs> 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 and you know, great. And you know what fixed it? The humidifier. Mm-hmm. Great. <laughs> oh boy. Um, and if you have any monster requests or stories, be sure to send them in. That's fucking hilarious. Yeah. Like we're we're all, we're all we've got all all three shots were boosted. You haven't left the house in three months, two months. Well, t- yeah, since November. <laughs> no, since bef- since the month before November. <laughs> um, yeah. He's like, no, I'm confident we're good. Um, let's see. You could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com and my Twitter is at crypto brandon. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at mu 27 My Twitter is at JF Dunham. Uh, my website is John and my email is John at CryptoPediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com and his email is Tom Mike Hill at gmail.com. I also want to point out the intro was done by you. I don't think we've ever mentioned that. I put produced by Brandon Boyer on every episode, but like I don't I don't think I've literally ever mentioned we've literally ever mentioned the fact that you made the introduction for the podcast. I don't do in- intros. Yeah. I don't know where all of the, the, the audio comes from for that still. <laughs> they're all from um Well they're like sighting videos, right? They're and like sighting newscasts. Videos, but they're they're specifically from like newscasts that aired like it's as public gettable as I could because I don't want to like get anything that was produced by some other company. So yeah, it's yeah. all just it's out there. It's just newscasts where people were talking to the news about things they saw. Also, um, I found something out. You up you put the entirety of um the Screaming Cowboy song from the start of the Screaming Cowboy section onto an episode of the podcast. <laughs> and I found that out because I got a content ID mark when I was uploading the episodes. <laughs> Oh yeah, I forgot. Oh yeah, you might get a few of those now that I think about it. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm definitely going to get a few of those. (laughs) So luckily they don't count as copyright strikes, but I can edit around them. So yeah, Yeah. I found that out though. That was a funny moment. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Did you just get an email? Like, how did they flag that? And did it tell you specifically what song it was? Yes. So Content ID specifically picks out what song it is. Yeah. Um, and the way it works is we have like a studio tab that we can yeah. access. And it showed me all the studio shit. And it does a check, right? So there's like a column that's like clear, clear, clear. And then there's Content ID warning. <laughs> and like the way it works is like, the person who owns the content ID can can do ads on your video yeah. and they make money and you don't make money. So like, I was just kind of like, well, we're not making any money off of this, but like, I don't want the guy, the screen cowboys to make money off of this episode. Cause they literally are just a bit at the end. Yeah. Like you, you can, <laughs> you're going to get several of those. They're all after the end credits. <laughs> no, I know. I know. Feel I'm wondering to- if the porn hub, Cut, feel I'm free wondering, to cut those out if the Pornhub theme is going to get flagged. I wonder if the Pornhub one's going to trigger. <laughs> I know Honey Dipper Dan's probably going to cl- trigger it because that happened. Honey Dipper Dan was at the end of an episode. It, it was, but I don't know if they're still making money off M- Mad TV. There's there's a person who owns the copyright. Yeah, someone owns it still. Yeah. 
So we're probably going to get a flag on that at some point, but we'll see. Um, anywho, uh, I think that's the podcast. So yeah. <laughs> as always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. Mm.